Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us. I'm Christina Fox, the CEO of Tech Alliance. And as the Regional Innovation Center for Southwestern Ontario, Tech Alliance empowers world-class ventures and fuels growth in Canada's innovation economy. We champion and coach entrepreneurs to amplify and impact businesses and contribute to a bold technology community across Southwestern Ontario. If you'd like to engage with our, or with our venture growth team, read stories about innovation that is shaping our community with world-changing ventures or join other upcoming experiences, I invite you to subscribe to our newsletter or book a discovery call using the links that are in the chat. We are the place for dreamers, innovators, and world-changing ideas. In pursuit of creating spaces where innovation thrives, we must act, be bold and lift others as we rise. And we strive to do that in all that we do. Before we get started, a few housekeeping points. All participants' mics are muted, so relax and enjoy. And today's webcast will be recorded and available for replay on our YouTube channel. I encourage you to add any questions in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen and feel free to contribute to the chat feature as well. So protecting intellectual property is critical to fuel and maintain Canada's innovation economy. Ventures need to be aware of the laws surrounding IP to ensure that ideas, concepts, and inventions are safeguarded with a well thought out and documented IP strategy. So today's webcast, Copyright, Protecting Your Idea, is the first in this three-part series, and links to the next two webcasts will also be dropped in the chat for you to register. We are delighted to have with us today the Alexis Conrad, who is an intellectual property advisor at the Canadian Intellectual Property Office and a champion for Canadian innovation through strategic intellectual property business strategy. We love following Alexis on Twitter and I encourage you to do the same. So today, Alexis is gonna walk us through what copyright is, the scope that it covers, the value it has, and how to register and manage your business for wealth generation. So with that, Alexis, over to you. Thank you very much, Christina. That was a fantastic introduction. Thanks everybody for coming today. It looks like we've got some good numbers. Um, you Tech Alliance did a really awesome job of giving me a synopsis of who the attendees were today. And it looks like we do have a broad audience. So we will cover a broad variety of topics as we move through. Um, if we want to take a look at copyright in general, um, basically based on the audience here, I think everybody knows copyright covers works of art. It covers so many things ranging from music to poetry to photography right through to software. Um, so we're gonna talk about a variety of things. I do tend to deviate from presentations sometimes, so please bear with me. And uh, hopefully if we have some questions as they come up, uh, we'll be able to get to what everybody wants to talk about if we have enough time. Okay, so basically I just mentioned that copyright covers so many different things. And especially as we are living in a digital world, it's pretty much impossible to avoid uh, copyright protection in anything that you do. It affects every single business that I know in some capacity or another. Um, it protects you in many different ways. It can be defended in many different ways and it allows you to do many different things with everything from brands to your product itself. Okay, so um, next slide. Sorry, Sarah. We started with a few tech issues and. She's generously uh, being my clicker here. Okay. Yeah, so basically just a quick synopsis. We're gonna cover what copyright is, what it does and doesn't protect, how it's a valuable business asset, how you can register it yourself, um, and best practices to managing it. There when this just started, that uh, intellectual property refers to creations of the mind. Uh, um, so intellectual property, there's many different types of intellectual property. And what we know today is that um, we're dealing with copyright, one of the types of intellectual property as an original work. Um, and it differs from other types of IP in the sense that an original work of art is protected automatically upon its creation in a fixed form. So may that be on paper, musical notation, a file saved on a computer drive, uh, in, a cloud, in the cloud, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so what are artistic works? We touched on it briefly, right? Everything, painting, sculptures, photographs, I mentioned software, 
Um, in particular, we see uh, graphic user interface being protected by copyright more and more, uh, in addition to other types of protection, but that is something important to note. And then as we move forward, we can take a look at, in particular, um, literary work. So these are obvious, right? Anything expressed in print, literally. Uh, it can be forms, website content, uh, software, computer programs, pamphlets, you name it. Um, it can be hard copies, hard covered, soft covered books, um, journals, notebooks, templates, so many different things that businesses and artists can come across using. Okay, uh, next in line to works of art, we've got musical works, and that should seem pretty self explanatory, uh, ranging from everything from musical composition uh, with or without words, um, and as well, it can, uh, it touches and protects on musical compositions. Okay, dramatic works. Again, it should seem pretty obvious, but again, motion picture films, actual plays, screenplays, and scripts related to all of these things. Um, an interesting thing we can talk about is we see a lot of people wondering how individuals are ripping off others' songs and doing uh, parody covers and things like that. But as it goes with copyright, you tend to be able to get away with um, you tend to get away with things from a musical perspective when you do turn things into a parody. Okay, so types of works we're dealing with compilation. So arrangements, right? That can deal with everything from dramatic works and musical and literary, but also data. Uh, and this is becoming absolutely in integral in today's digital uh, economy. Um, they're more and more valuable. They're being valued differently in businesses. They are protected differently and they are seen as something to be paid attention to. Okay, so our next work of art. Um, okay, so we weren't gonna go into comedy, but I made a brief mention on that. Okay, so what basically is copyright? Right. It basically it's the exclusive legal right to produce and reproduce, publish or perform your original artistic, literary, musical or dramatic work. To obtain it in Canada, you have to file an application with the Canadian Intellectual Property Office if you want it to be formally registered. Copyright does not need to be formally registered to be considered a legal right. You can benefit from automatic protection just by the creation of your original work of art. Okay, so what does it protect? Well, all works of art in the Copyright Act, um, and it allows you to prevent others from reproducing your work or any substantial portion of it. Owning that work means you have the exclusive right to commercially benefit for its use. Those who want to use your work have to acquire it or get the, right, the rights from you and get your permission to use them. Um, in Canada, you are automatically protected in all uh, Bernie Convention members, member countries rather, um, which basically includes most of the world's countries, including Canada. So while other forms of intellectual property don't have uh, worldwide protection. Copyright, to some extent, it's argued that more or less does. Um, and in Canada, you benefit from moral rights, which is something we'll address later in the module. And moral rights are not something that are protected uh, in every jurisdiction to the same extent. Okay. All right, so what are the criteria for copyright to be protected? It has to be original. Clearly, it has to be an original work of art as the definition states. It has to be an expression and it has to be a fixation. Those are the three things and they seem like they should be pretty obvious, but they're not always. So originality means that it has to be the result of your own creativity. It's not something uh, that you can copy more or less. You have to use your own skill and judgment to create the work. Where does it get complicated? You've got two or more people working on, uh, for example, uh, different canvases. They can produce two different original works. Okay, and then what does expression mean? Well, expression can be 
If, okay, so copyright protects the expression of an idea, not the, not the ideas by themselves, right? So if you write a book about a boy who lives in the jungle with wild animals, you have to copyright over that specific story and the way you choose to express it. However, you can't stop anyone else from writing a book about the idea behind the book, a boy who lives in a jungle with wild animals. Therefore, many expressions of this idea could come to be, such as Tarzan versus the Jungle Book. You don't own the general idea. And then it gets to a fixation. When we're talking about fixation, they must be fixed in a material format. People get confused by that because this is such a digital world, but it can be paper, video recordings, audio recordings, data sets, hard drives, and memory cards. Okay, so yeah, just a little image that makes it right. So related rights. Okay, neighboring rights that protect the legal and economic interests of certain persons and legal entities contribute to making works available to the public. So we've got three categories of beneficiaries when it comes to related rights. And we're gonna have to do the little hand thing again, Sarah. So the first one, the first one what we're gonna talk about is broadcast organizations. Seems simple enough. Beneficiaries, broadcast organizations, of course. They contribute to making these works available to the public. The second is another one that should seem obvious, but producers of sound recordings. They are needed in order to basically move uh, works of art available to the public. And the third one, another one that does seem obvious is the performers themselves. Without the performers, many works of art are not possible. Okay. Um, distinguishing authorship and ownership. The creator of an original work will always remain its author, but the author of the work may not always be the owner. That gets confusing. Any other person or legal entity could become the owner through a transfer of ownership of the work. We need to distinguish these two concepts because it allows us to fully understand copyright protection since the author will always be tied to the work and that their life will always have a bearing on the duration of copyright protection. But that doesn't mean they will own it during that duration. An example of where we see this sometimes has to do with um, musical works. Uh, you will have an artist who will pass away. Um, the estate will go on to own the work. And depending on which jurisdiction that that individual lived in, the estate may continue to own um, that copyright for an additional 50 or 70 years past the date of death, which is why we see royalties for deceased artists continue for so long. Okay, so moral rights. This is something that's pretty important when it comes to certain uh, jurisdictions such as Canada. So what the heck are moral rights of? They protect the author's right of attribution and integrity. I always like to add emphasis on integrity. So moral rights can't be sold or given away, even in the case of a sale. The author retains their moral rights in the work unless they choose to waive these rights. The most famous case of this, to give a really good example, is the case of Canadian artist, Michael Snow, and his sculptural installation, Flight Stop, at the Eaton Center. This case made it all the way up to the Supreme Court. Um, basically what ended up happening is one year, the Eaton Center decided that they were going to affix these really loud red Christmas bows onto these geese. And the sculptor, the original artist said, no, this is not, this is against the integrity of my work. This is infringing on my moral rights. I did not want these geese to represent any given type of holiday, any type of particular culture, et cetera, et cetera. And he got fought all the way to Supreme Court and he was awarded, uh, he won. And uh, the Eaton Center lost the right to alter the geese as they saw fit. Now a direct result of this case going up to the Supreme Court is that now when many artists and even within software where people are commissioned to create something, part of that contract is they are asked to sign away their moral rights. Okay. Copyright symbol. 
what does it mean? Marking your work with a copyright symbol is not mandatory under Canadian copyright law, but it's a really useful reminder to anybody that may be thinking about ripping off your original work of art. You can very easily use the copyright symbol followed by the name of the copyright owner and the year of first publication to put people on notice that this is in fact something that I do value as copyright that I created. A really good practice but you don't have to use the C symbol. Okay, so when we talk about the duration of copyright protection, and this kind of ties back to what I was talking about in terms of music royalties, is that copyright lasts for the life of the author plus 50 years after the end of that calendar year. When the term of copyright protection ends or expires, the work falls into the public domain. Any work in the public domain is accessible by the public, and everyone has an equal right to reproduce or republish the work. Understanding copyright. Value added. This gets complicated. A lot of people, when they look at patents, for example, they can, the math will sometimes be a little bit easier to do. But we'll start by talking about, we'll click on the green dollar sign here. Um, it rewards authors, obviously, for their efforts because of their economic incentive, right? They can either license or sell their rights in their original works. They can buy and sell, sorry, trade and reproduce, keep going. And uh, brand images. Okay, so while people traditionally think of a brand as solely being protected by trademark, the brand image itself, jingles associated with it, promotional materials are protected by copyright as well. And it can help build brand identity, distinguishing goods and services from those of your competition and providing your business with a competitive edge. So it's used to layer on top of other forms of protection like trademarks. And sometimes this layered form of protection can be used in court more successfully than maybe the actual trademark itself uh, just by the nature of what copyright protects differently, as we discussed earlier on. And lastly, the value added is it helps support your claim of ownership when you enforce your rights against counterfeit products or copycat brands. And that is industry agnostic right across the board. Okay, so how do you use your copyright strategically? It can assist you in commercially benefiting from your works by forbidding copies, easy enough. You, you prohibit others from doing what you have done. Um, you can prohibit, for example, even derivative works. You can prevent unauthored distribution. You can prevent public performances and protect your reputation. Make sure you own the work though. The creator of an original work is normally the owner However, if the work is created in course of employment, it's often possible, if not usually the case, where the employer owns the copyright in the work. Again, referring back to authorship versus ownership. If you commission someone to create content for you or on a for hire basis, they may also legally own the copyright in that work. So it's a really good practice with any of the contractors and employees you're using that are creating any form of copyright, that you have them assign copyright ownership according to what works for your business, if it's important for you and your business to own that copyright. And also consider moral rights within creators, because even if you own the copyright, the moral rights remain with the creator unless they're waived. And again, back to the case, um, the Snow case that went to the Supreme Court, again, we see a lot of contracts, creative contracts, software contracts that are now having people waive their moral rights altogether to work around that. Okay, assigning your copyright. Copyright assignment occurs when a holder transfers ownership of all or part of their right to another person or organization permanently. You can, do a, you, you can decide to assign your work to benefit the other person or to use uh, money to focus on other aspects of your innovation or business. Um, again, really, really common, similar to how other people will assign uh, ownership of other forms of intellectual property as well. License your copyright. This one should seem obvious. 
right? An alternative to assigning your entire copyright is to license it away in a limited capacity and it allows people to remain some control over their work in other conditions as well. Okay. Generating income. Many industries rely on this business model for services, right? So you can take a look at an organization, any software company, right? You can look at um, Dolby Digital. A lot of what they're doing is licensing copyright other than uh, actual patents as well. Video streaming services, another example. In our digital economy, this is a big money maker when utilized properly. How you set it up to execute it that way will depend on your business model. It will depend on your product or your services related to that product specifically and your own business plan, what your own objectives are. There is no perfect way to do this. It's going to depend on a lot of criteria, which is a really, which is a prime example of why you need to bring in copyright experts when you get to that point. Okay. Um, yeah, licensing, right? You can do exclusive licenses based on jurisdictions. There's many different ways to do it where you can still remain in control of who uses your copyright and under which circumstances. Copyright and other IP rights. So we talked about layering when it came to parts of a brand, right? So layering uh, copyright on top of trademark protection. It's applicable as well layering when we talk about computer software. It's a literary work. The copyright protection prevents unauthored use of your code. However, if your code adds new, non-obvious functionality to a computer system, you're going to consider obtaining a patent as well. You don't know in the future which method will or of protection, which layer of protection will allow you to get further if you are trying to defend uh, against infringement. And sometimes it's pretty surprising that it may be copyright over an actual patent. Okay. Oh, Le Cirque du Soleil, yes. So copyright and other IP rights, We this is right back to the brand identity. Um, this artistic design on itself, uh, on its own, never mind um, the fact that they can also copyright Cirque du Soleil, uh, the design itself is a layered protection on top of the trademark. Okay. Uh, how do you register? Oh, in Canada. Now remember, this can change. You don't have to register it because you do get copyright protection automatically when the original work is created, but there are benefits to registering in Canada, such as rights in court. If someone does infringe upon your copyright, it is much easier to take something that is formally registered to the courts and say, see, it's formally registered. It's mine. I did it first. Please make whatever they're doing stop as well as a notice to the public. You have the registered rights. You can publicly say, hey, this is mine. Do not participate with this um, infringer. They are not the real deal. Um, and this is similar in terms of why people say, do I have to register my trademark? Well, no, you have some automatic protection, but by registering, again, it's a lot easier to do, go to a court and say, hey, I had this first. Uh, but you do have to keep in mind, just like with a trademark, which uh, country, other countries you're going in. So rights in court, a certificate of registration, it's evidence, basically just what we said. Uh, evidence may be challenged. It doesn't mean that someone may not have some evidence somewhere that they happen to do somehow the exact same thing two years earlier. But it will be a lot easier to work this out if you do have your original registration. Okay, um, other than rights in court, we're talking about uh, our rights in public next and notice to the public. If it's registered, another party can't claim that they were not aware and had no reasonable grounds for suspecting that your work was protected by copyright. They can't get around that concept. And again, that's just something else that will protect you in the courts as well. Uh, how do you search a copyright database? Well, there's a couple of ways to do it. In person at CIPO's Client Service Center pre-COVID, 
now you can make a phone call. Um, and we have a Canadian copyrights database online as well. So it's a good idea to do a search before you go through the rigmarole and putting up some money to register it formally. Very, very easy database to use, um, our Canadian copyright database. And if you have any questions, our client service center is always available to walk you through it. If you are working with a very large team and you have someone on your team responsible for copyright, this may be something they have a lot of experience doing themselves. And if they are, they may not need assistance and they will be able to do that on behalf of your business. Um, identifying the work, right? So every application for registration has, um, it has to be restricted to a single work. You can't put multiple works of art into one registration. That does deter some people as they see that basically as a way for costs to creep up. I wouldn't worry too much about that because as you're working through what you're going to do with your copyright, one of the first things you're gonna do is try to identify of all of the things that you could copyright, which is most valuable to you. And typically people start with their top few and work their way down from there. And you can't include descriptive matter that doesn't constitute part of the title. That is the other thing that hangs people up in the process, especially when they're working on books and encyclopedias. Okay. What do you include? Your name and address of the owners, the name of the authors of the work. Again, remember owner and author, not necessarily the same thing. The title of the single work, the category of the work, dramatic, artistic, etc., and the date and place of the first publication of applicable. Pretty basic. Although sometimes people do have a difficult time looking back and trying to figure out when it was specifically first created. All right. Other things that you're going to include on your registration um, is a declaration confirming that the applicant for this actually is the author of the work the owner of the copyright of the work, right? Uh, an assignee of the copyright or a person who an, in, has an interest in the copyright has been granted that license. So the owner of the copyright in the work can be a business and that is where you will have a representative helping you out with that. Sometimes in-house, sometimes not. Sometimes external counsel, okay? Then you submit your registration. You have to pay fees. You file it, send it in online or you mail it the old fashioned way. Um, you don't need to include a copy of your work. They don't review or assess your work in any way. So copies of works will not be accepted. And uh, once you receive that registration, there is nothing further you need to do to maintain it. No further fees that you would sometimes see to maintain or that you do see when maintaining trademarks and patents, et cetera. Okay. Managing your copyright, assignments and licenses. For Canadian copyright, you can register any assigned or licensed uh, contracts of your work with SIBO directly. You can submit the original agreement or photocopy of it online by mail, along with the prescribed fee for each work affected by an assignment of a license. CEPA will link, retain that copy of the documentation and return the original documentation with the certificate of registration. What I always tell people, if you're in a situation where you need to register a license of your product, please, please, please do contact the Intellectual Property Institute of Canada and make sure you are working with legal representation so that someone is making sure the contracts you are using for the licenses that you are granting are in fact the right contracts to be using. I cannot stress that enough. You absolutely need to be flagging a professional at that point, okay? Um, monitoring copyright infringement. How do we do this? It's a really hot topic in the digital age. It's so easy for people to copy works. Infringement occurs the moment a person uses content protected by copyright in a way that violates your rights as granted in the Copyright Act. So what do you do about this? Well, you have to monitor it to make sure it happens in the first place. So if we go to the next slide, what we're going to talk about 
unless they've changed it, is monitoring the infringement itself. Um, and how do you catch it? So in larger companies, often there's whole departments that work on this, especially where copyright is such a value, valuable portion of their IP portfolio. There are third-party organizations that monitor copyright infringement. There are software tools that monitor copyright infringement. There are legal firms that have people on their team that can help monitoring copyright infringement as well. But if that copyright infringement occurs, only a court can rule whether that infringement of copyright has actually occurred or not. Another reason why it's a really good idea to have it formally registered. Okay, so what do you do? To help avoid, so for you, you wanna know that to avoid infringement issues and litigation, a really good rule of thumb is to seek authorization before using someone else's work. So as much as you're worried about people ripping you off, you need to be equal, equally respectful to make sure that you're not doing the same to somebody else's work of art. And this can apply to software as well. How do you, can you do this? Well, you can search the register of copyrights to find out. And often you can find out directly within companies' websites what their copyright is. So if you know what you're doing and you're questioning whether or not you have the right to use something, check. The language is usually right there if you look for it. Okay. Um, fair dealing. Okay, so fair dealing, it's an exception in the Copyright Act that all the journalists I love to know, love to talk about and sometimes take advantage of in ways that they have learned how to do. So what this does is it outlines permitted use of works protected by copyright for specific purposes without authorization education, right? So right now I'm using a deck that's been produced by the Canadian Intellectual Property Office, and I'm using it to educate you at the Tech Alliance. So there would be nothing wrong with Tech Alliance using this presentation with their own materials that they provide to all of their member companies to help keep their membership educated on the subject matter. No harm, no foul there. Research and private study, fine. That one can get sketchy. Um, and parody and satire. That's what I mentioned when we were talking about uh, cover songs that definitely are parody. We see comedians often ripping off comedians, although comedians have a really interesting way of letting each other know that what they have done in terms of copyright infringement is not funny. And they usually take to the stand of just making fun of another comedian for ripping off their idea and letting it go back and forth. And it's kind of their own little way of dealing with infringement that can be quite humorous. So you can, for research and private study, criticize and review, and that'll constitute as fair dealing as well. And of course, I mentioned a cheeky comment about journalists, news reporting. It definitely qualifies as um, a fair dealing, but what you need to do when you're criticizing or reporting, you have to state the source and author. Otherwise, it does not constitute fair dealing. If anybody has any questions about that, we can chat about it later. So how do you manage your copyright? And how do you detect your copyright infringement? Again, I mentioned this on an earlier slide. You can search online for distinct parts of your literary works to see if they've been used without permission. Often with literary works, and um, an original author will get word that someone within their network saw it somewhere, and it comes to them word of mouth. Um, you can do online searching for images using keywords that are related to your artistic work, such as photos and illustrations. Um, you can search graphics within Google, for example. You can set online alerts with keywords related to your works. And you can look for suspicious accounts or users on social media websites or multimedia streaming platforms. And again, there are third party services that can assist you with this as well, especially if you are working in a business with a very large copyright portfolio, it will become too cumbersome to manage for, uh, and to keep an eye out for infringement on your own. Another great conversation to speak to uh, an intellectual property institute of Canada lawyer uh, or age or, or lawyer, sorry, in this case, it deals with copyright specifically. Okay. Um, and here, I know I've said this a few times, I cannot emphasize enough 
that you need to know when the right time is to seek advice from an IP professional. This is someone that specifically deals with copyright, has experience dealing with copyright, knows the ins and the outs, doesn't just educate about it, knows all the tricks, has seen it, been there and done that. And you're going to find them through the Intellectual Property Institute of Canada. Um, and SIPO does not offer advice as to whether a particular act is acceptable or constitutes infringement. We can use examples to teach, we can speak in humor about things, but we don't, um, we do not give advice. This is educational purposes only. You have to discuss these issues with an IP professional, knowledge specific, with knowledge specifically in copyright law. Really important not to go to just a patent lawyer or a patent agent. You're dealing specifically with copyright. You want someone in that field. Okay. Yeah. How are all, all the ways that IP professionals can help you? Um, they can help you save money. We should play a game if I can remember what's under these little circles, but I don't want to embarrass myself. Sarah, can we click to the, um, the thank you? Oh, I broke it. Yeah, there we go. So IP professionals can help you by explaining all of your um, potential types of protection, the exemptions and the limitations. They can help you with, I think this might be infringement, registration. Yeah, they can represent you in case of infringement. Uh, they can help you determining if you're entitled to statutory damages or other forms of remedies with that infringement. And they can help you with writing assignment and licensing agreements. Those are the contracts we were speaking about earlier. The moment you are looking at licensing out what your original work of art is, you need to be flagging a professional. And I would also say they can help you with third party monitoring and all sorts of things that circle around the world of copyright protection. Okay, so some resources. The SIPA website, we've got some walkthroughs. We have some more educational uh, modules if you're interested in learning more in depth. We can help you apply um, online services more. Um, we've got some videos. We've got, uh, we have some other, other decks as well and everything is accessible through our copyright webpage. Remember, different jurisdictions are going to have a bit of a different ballgame when it comes to uh, copyright as well. So if you're not just protecting in Canada, you want to make sure that you're learning the ins and outs of other jurisdictions as well. So on the next slide, we... Should have... Okay, more resources. Hiring an IP professional. We do have a link. Um, that will help you figure out who is registered within Canada and that will also provide details on connecting with the Intellectual Property Institute of Canada. I actually think they're the next slide that we can move over to. Oh, copyright, eh, not yet. Copyright Board of Canada, right? So the Copyright Board of Canada is mandated to set royalties that are fair and reasonable for both copyright owners and users of copyright protected works. Um, your professional, your legal copyright professional will have an understanding of how this works in detail, but you can learn more about it on their webpage. And WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization, another fantastic resource for education. And what it does, it provides an international angle on copyright protection. You can consult their webpage to get a bunch of information if you ever have, I know as entrepreneurs, you have so much free time, but if you do find yourself with some extra time and you'd like to learn more about the international angle, WIPO is a great organization. Okay. And lastly, Okay, it didn't include IPIC, but IPIC does also have some fantastic stuff up on their website. So you've kind of gone through with the basics here. We're going to do a future module where we will not have the delay in tech. I apologize to everybody. This was my fault. I um, thought it would be better for me not to control that, but we are doing some future sessions as well. Um, copyright, I would say, is what it is. It's not very exciting at a basic level. 
Um, the patents presentation that I do will be after the election. So it will be uh, a little bit different. We're going to put some flavor on it. And we're especially going to pull in some uh, use cases from the London area, which I'll be excited to share with everybody. It's been fascinating to research some of the awesome patent successes there. Um, and the same on the trademark world. So I look forward to those sessions in the future. And the slides may look a little bit different because we are going to we're going to make them a little more specific to the London area. Awesome. Thanks, Alexis. This is fabulous. Thank um, you. So we've got we've got some questions that have come in on the Q&A. And okay. um, so if it's okay with you doing a time check, we're at 146. So we still have a few minutes left. Awesome. And it looks like we still have a good solid uh, number of participants in our live session. So first question, you sort of you've sort of covered it um, with copyright um, in Canada and abroad, but what are the question is, what are my rights if someone uses my copyrighted work outside of Canada? Okay, which question was that? As to, uh, was that your question? Yeah, it's a question it on here. That got, yeah, so what are my rights if someone uses my copyrighted work outside of Canada? Oh, outside of Canada, in the digital realm? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, so first of all, what you're going to do is you're going to call your copyright professional. You're instantly going to call someone. Um, depending on how it has been infringed, it can be dealt with within the Canadian court system, um, depending where that person is located or how they access um, the, the website or they've accessed the materials or where they have copied those materials, where they've copied the materials may be different from where they actually exist. There are so many different things that need to be taken into consideration that you won't possibly have. There's the blanket statement that can apply to it. You need to get in touch with a copyright lawyer, 100%. So many different things that need to be taken into consideration. And they're the only individual group of individuals that are going to be able to assist with that. Okay. Um, and I don't know if it's sort of a follow-on question here, but, but does a copyright registration with SIPO matter against infringement? by an entity south of the border and if they publish only south of the border? It absolutely can matter. Again, it's gonna depend on the specific situation. Um, and another reason why it's a fantastic reason to make sure you actually did register. A lot easier to show that formal registration of the copyright in another jurisdiction uh, from a respected jurisdiction, uh, especially because while it may only be formally registered in Canada, that work of art was still created and used on the World Wide Web digitally in other jurisdictions as well. So it will facilitate your ability to show that you have that copyright automatically within another jurisdiction. Okay. I hope that helped a little bit. I think so. That was that was a question from the audience. Another one, because um, you've referenced you referenced it in the slide deck and also just now about seeking advice from an IP professional. So um, in one of your statements, you said you, you know, you need to know when to do that, or you, you need to, you need to understand that there's a right time to do that. So yep. how does someone know when to do this? Is there, is there, um, you know, a particular journey that you see over and over again, where if a founder doesn't register the copyright, that that's, you know, a little bit more tricky or is, is there a, is there yeah. a um, timing? Okay. So a trend that I see often in the software space is yeah. that people see, they see counsel too late when it comes to copyright. Yeah. They, they have thought about it too late. And then they get to a situation where they have a, a customer, they have a client that has, they have together drafted a license about the copyright. And they just haven't thought enough to think that they really do need professional advice to be looking at this. And they get themselves into deep water. So I would say, no later than when you're thinking about having conversations with a customer or a partner about using your product, no later than then do you need to speak with a professional. Ideally, you're speaking much sooner, right? You've got a product. Um, I'm going to assume if it's software, you need to speak to someone that is an IP professional because while well, you have some IP protection in it that is just copyright, you need to be considering as well um, a functional patent as well as uh, a design patent or we call it industrial design in Canada there may be multiple things that you need to protect in that product okay so yeah it, it, it's uh that's the trend when we're dealing with true arts when we're talking about um 
authorship of books, of plays, of, uh, of cre creative works in that sense. If you're creating something um, for someone else, yeah, you need to be having these conversations with a professional right away. If someone is doing something for you right away, have those conversations as well. You don't want to have any confusion about who actually owns what and when. It'll only cause you grief down the road and it'll be more expensive down the road as opposed to spending a little money up front with a professional and getting everything uh, squared away. Now, if you're not dealing with anyone else and you have just written a book, not just, but you've written a book, at the time when you're shopping it out to publishers, it's a good idea to have some registered copyright on it before you start shopping it out to publishers. So it really depends specifically on what you're doing and who you're doing it with and what your end goal with your copyright is. There's no cut and paste answer for it. I have a great question related to authorship and ownership. I'm just gonna circle back on the, the question that I just asked on a follow-on, a quick one. Um, how do you find an IP professional? When you were showing that one slide and it talked about IP professional, can you click through and find um, a listing on CPO or yeah, if, if not, you okay. can. There is a listing and they also will link you directly to Epic and the Intellectual Property Institute of Canada will list all, you can search by um, Yeah, and it, within the Epic website, you can search based on specific expertise. Another really good thing to do for people is to ask around, right? You work with many different entrepreneurs. Who have they worked with? Who have they had success with? And I always tell people too, when you're trying to, um, when you're kind of interviewing around for IP professionals, it's kind of like a marriage. It has to be someone you actually like, because you need to be able to be comfortable enough asking questions that you know, you may feel are silly and sometimes they may give you advice that you don't want to follow. And it's sometimes it's okay not to follow their advice. You need to be comfortable enough in the relationship. So be picky. Um, you don't have to work with the first person you find and you can take ownership over that. You guys are clients um, to them as professional providers and take confidence in knowing that you're in charge of, of who you work with. Okay. Um, switching gears a little bit to, um, the ownership and um, authorship uh, questions coming in. Do you think infringement claims will increase given the rise of the creator economy and the broadening of copyright applications? So oh, they are. Yeah. Absolutely, they are. I'm seeing more and more businesses with in-house copyright counsel now um, just to keep up with it. Uh, yes, 100%. And I actually don't know that the various systems know how they're going to deal with that. Um, because you have to have manpower on the back end of enforcement. So is this just going to delay enforcement? Are things, or are we going to see new structures put in place within these organizations, such as CEPO and other places, to assist businesses um, and authors to deal with uh, the demand? Yeah, there's, there's definitely a demand that's happening for sure. And you think if it's a, a, a manual game of whack-a-mole, to, to chase and look for copyright infringement on your copyright, um, then it's the question of how long does it take to, to uh, uh, settle um, any of the, the claims. Okay, so another, another switching gears, um, a question about cost benefit wise, is yep. there a preferred best practice on which type of IP protection to get first? Um, and the person's also included mobile software products. Oh, a mobile software product. Oh, so this one's specific. So I would recommend that this person reach out to you guys and connect them with me and we can, without, you know, disclosing online what they're dealing with. It depends, right? So um, really great question. There's probably at least three, four layers of IP that they could be considering. And the answer not only depends on your specific product, but it also depends on the global situation. What's the landscape with the business that you're working in? What is your competition doing? What are they filing? There might be a reason they're not filing a certain type of IP because it may not be very relevant in um, the hottest jurisdictions that you're dealing in. Um, so lots of things to take into consideration, a really good reason to look at doing an IP landscaping exercise early on. Okay. And going back to sort of the creator economy, what, uh, or employees, because we were talking about ownership and authorship, Think of um, not a creator, but instead an employee of a company. What should they be doing to, to protect themselves with their creations when they're working? Oh, in a, in a, a gig economy, are you talking about the gig economy? How do they protect themselves? 
I have seen some really bad things happen in that economy. And I think I'm starting to see more and more um, professional service providers in the IP space who are doing, I don't want to say pro bono because it's not, but they're putting together templates and kits so that even if these people don't have the revenue to purchase um, the legal activities that they need um, at a market rate, that there are some basic templates and forms they can follow to make sure that they are being protected themselves with each contract that they pursue. Mm -hmm. um, and if you can't find those, um, there are a lot of good ones with Epic that I know are doing this for those in the gig economy. Whatever you do, do not go online and get a contract that you find because it may be a contract that's relevant in the state of California and may mean nothing for you to protect you here in Ontario. So always see what you can get for free. And there's a lot of great members of Epic that do fantastic pro bono. And you would be surprised how many helpers there are in the IP community that want to make sure our Ontario and our Canadian um, are not just our inventors, but our creators are protected. Awesome. Thank you. I appreciate that. So gig economy and creator economy, thinking about the person who's the independent contractor and being able to sort of reach into the village of folks who are prepared to help. And what about then um, uh, a person for whom works for a company? So an employee of a larger enterprise, how yep. do they make sure that they have their ideas protected? And how do you have that conversation, I suppose? Ooh, <laughs> that's a tough one. So I'll use um, an engineering front. I won't, I won't use an artistic front. So there's going to be IP language in your employment contract. With really big employers, and most employers, you're not going to have a lot of opportunity to negotiate what the IP clauses are in your employment contract. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't be aware of what they are. I always tell friends, if they're unsure of what the language means, pay a couple hundred bucks if you can to someone to make sure you know exactly the situation you're getting into. And I have had colleagues and friends who have opted not to take jobs when they realize just how stifling and restrictive those IP clauses would be. On the other end, I've had friends that have gone and gotten some advice and it has encouraged them to take a job with a specific company over another because they have such fantastic IP incentives that are built right into their employment contracts that it's a no brainer for them. It allows them to uh, maintain some autonomy for some side projects that aren't related to the, the parent employer while still being committed and having all of those related types of um, IP work owned by the organization. I'm a huge fan of HR departments that encourage um, businesses to not just stifle um, all creators that uh, join their organizations. I think there's a healthy balance. I could get in trouble for saying that, but yeah. that's, my, that's my professional take. You okay. can still protect IP and keep your people happy. Awesome, thank you. And um, I think I've got two more questions. We're at 2 p.m. Maybe we'll do okay. these two quick questions before we sure. very well. Um, so can you tell the question is, please tell the procedure for global startups, um, places for the websites to register IP, probably SIPO, but what about global startups or um, registering globally, not at a country level? Okay, so we're not gonna go global. We're not gonna, we're not gonna do global, right? So, um, we're just gonna take that thought completely out of our minds. We're gonna look back at our IP landscaping and we're gonna figure out um, jurisdictionally where it makes sense to do formal registrations. You have automatic protection, but where you're going to formally register, you're going to do a landscaping exercise and you're gonna figure out which jurisdictions and what their processes are where you should formally be registering. And if you're looking at a whole bunch of jurisdictions for a specific reason, again, get on the phone with someone at Epic, figure it out properly. Don't kind of willy nilly it and land yourself in trouble because those are expensive mistakes to fix. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what are my author's rights as no code dev? Can't see the quest. That question is at the bottom. Uh, yes, it's in the, I think it's in the chat direct to you and I. Open to, I'm not seeing this one, sorry. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll repeat it. What are my author's rights as a no-code developer? 
Oh, a no code developer. Oh yeah. boy. Sorry. Um, it depends on your employment contract. <laughs> Right. It's, I, I mean, most of the time, I think it's usually none. Yeah. Um, you can assume there's none, but check your employment contract. Okay. Sounds good. That, yeah. I, sorry, that was kind of blunt, but. I'm not sure if there's, if there's more background to that, whether or not it's someone who is developing a no code platform um, that is used by others or whether or not it's the author is developing uh, no code on behalf of their employer. So I wonder, is would there be yeah. any different response if it was somebody who is a creator developing no code um, as as a developer? It would depend on the situation. Yeah. Best to be in touch with an IP professional or connect with folks at. CEDA. Yeah, yeah. We can connect. We can we can you know give some educational examples, but we we can't give. There's no legal advice. There's just some educational examples, and we can point you in the direction of someone. If it's of great concern, we'll help you hunt down this specific answer. Awesome. Well, on that then, um, we're at uh, just past two o'clock. So it, I have the great privilege of thanking you for joining us today. You Thank have you. enormous amount of applicable and, and uh, pertinent information about copyrights. We love the fact that we are with you for a three-part series and that we get to pick your big brain again um, over you. the next uh, couple of months. And so as a, as a regional innovation center, and you kind of reference this, that we certainly aim to inform and educate industry leaders and founders on how an IP strategy really helps to fuel their growth and fuel Canada's innovation economy and the idea of wealth creation. So I really appreciate that you spent time with us again today and being able to create some evergreen content while we're doing this to help entrepreneurs navigate through their journey. And we look forward to chatting with you again the next two webcasts. Uh, in the series are industrial design, the product looked, and that's on September 23rd. And yeah. the uh, third is the trademarks protecting your brand on September 30th. So until we see you again, All take right. care and we'll and talk to you soon. Thanks for having me. This was great. I look forward to seeing you guys soon. Awesome. Thanks, Alexis. Bye for now. Take care. Bye.